let's get started here. And so here we go, Chemistry 3101. This is chapter four, alkanes and cycloalkanes. So that's the topic of the entire chapter, just talking about hydrocarbons. And we spoke about alkanes when we looked at functional groups. And alkane technically isn't a functional group. Um, but if we compare um, these various types of hydrocarbons here, hydrocarbons are simply compounds that contain only hydrogen and carbon, no other elements. And we know that, that a carbon-carbon bond is completely nonpolar, and we know that a carbon-hydrogen bond is considered nonpolar. So all hydrocarbons are nonpolar. But if we break the classes of hydrocarbons down, you can see that we have saturated hydrocarbons and unsaturated hydrocarbons. So unsaturated hydrocarbons, these would be the alkenes, um, the alkynes, and aromatics as well. So compounds like ethylene, acetylene, and benzene. But we're going to talk most of the time about saturated hydrocarbons, right? Alkanes. They have the, the maximum number of hydrogens bonded per carbon atom. And we're going to talk a lot about how to name these type of compounds, how to name alkanes. Well, just a little bit of history on naming alkanes and naming organic compounds in general. It says that many organic compounds have common names. Okay, but in 1892, chemists were discovering more and more organic compounds all the time. And so they had to come up with some kind of systematic way of naming them. And so they get together and first they came up with, came up with what were known as the Geneva Rules, which later led to um, the IUPAC Rules, which is the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. If you just look at these four molecules here, you see we have formic acid. Now, where does that name come from? It's not, it doesn't come from any kind of systematic name. It's actually named after the Latin word for ant, formica. Um, urea is isolated from urine, so it's kind of easy to see the connection there. But then you get into some that are a little more interesting, like morphine. Like, where does that name come from? Well, it's actually, actually named after the god of dreams, the Greek god of dreams, Morpheus. And barbituric acid is even funnier. It was named by Adolf von, von Bayer, who discovered it, and he simply named it after a woman named Barbara that I guess he was, it says here, in honor of. I think he was just infatuated with her is what I read. Anyhow, now when we're talking about the IUPAC system, this is a systematic way of naming compounds. So sometimes you'll hear me refer to it as the IUPAC. Other times you'll hear me refer to it as a systematic way of naming compounds. They both mean the exact same thing. IUPAC, again, stands for International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. So this is a set of rules that we can use to name compounds that will be agreed upon, uh, agreed upon within the entire scientific community. And the reason that's important, especially you know, nowadays, is that it's a, it's, it's, it's a big world, right? And it's, well, I guess it's a small world in some ways. With the internet, we're able to communicate with scientists all across the world. And so if we're naming a molecule, we want to be able to communicate the name of that molecule to scientists in any other country um, on the planet. Okay, so we don't have time to memorize or to learn all of the rules of IUPAC nomenclature, but we're going to learn some of the basic rules in Chapter 4. So the first rule that you're going to learn is what's called identifying a parent chain. Now, a parent chain is simply the longest consecutive chain of carbons in a molecule. Here we have an alkane. Saturated hydrocarbon, we have lots of carbons, lots of hydrogens. And if we were to try to find the longest carbon chain, you might start and say, well, if I start here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. But if you look a little deeper, you might say, okay, well, let's see here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And in fact, you find that nine carbons in a row is the longest chain. Now you might be asking me, well, how do I find that, Mr. Dion? And the answer is trial and error. Okay, you just keep trying until you find the longest carbon chain. There is no better answer than that. Simply trial and error. Now, what about these carbon chains, right? If I have a chain of nine carbons, I, ha I have to know how to name that. I have to know how to name that parent chain. And you have to memorize um, the names of the, uh, the first 10 is what I said, or what it says in the book. I think it says to memorize the first 10 a straight chain alkane. Sometimes you'll hear these called N alkanes. So N alkanes, which just means they're linear. And that just means uh, normal alkanes or straight alkanes. We'll just go here, straight, straight alkanes. Because of course, an alkane can have branching. 
but they start with one through to 10 carbons. So you need to memorize it. If you have only one carbon, it's methane. If you have two, it's ethane. Three, it's propane. Four, it's butane. Five is pentane. Six is hexane. Seven is heptane. Eight is octane. Nine is nonane. Ten is decane. I think it's kind of handy to know these two here, undecane and dodecane, because they do come up from time to time in the class, 11 carbons in a row and 12 carbons in a row. But the first, you know, the first um, four, I think, are not nearly as intuitive. Methane, ethane, propane, and butane, not nearly as intuitive as these ones here, right? Pentane, you think of a pentagon, has five sides. A hexagon has six sides. Hept, in French, the word seven is, is set, which, you know, kind of looks like it's got the E-P-T in it. So that's how I remember that one. And then octane, you think of an octagon, nonane, none kind of sounds like nine, and then decane, well, the connection is obvious, you know, a decade. Anyhow, all right, so you have to have memorized methane through to decane, and again, I would recommend memorizing undecane and dodecane as well. All right, so what if the parent chain is cyclic, right? We're going to see many organic compounds uh, that are alkanes where the parent chain will just be a cycle of carbon, so they'll all be put in some kind of ring. Well, in that case, you look at the number of carbons and you prefix you prefix it with cyclo. So if we look at the triangle here, that's cyclopropane. Where does that come from? Well, it's got a total of one, two, three carbons in it. So we put cyclo before it because it, they're in a ring, right? They're in a ring. And then propane is what we would call a straight chain hydrocarbon, right? That would be propane. So this becomes cyclopropane. Right, if you have four carbons in a row, one, two, three, four, this is called butane, the same butane that's in a butane lighter. If you put them in a ring, however, you call that cyclobutane, right? We have one, two, three, four carbons here. If you have five carbons, you would call it cyclopentane. And you can probably guess that if you have six carbons in a ring like this, this would be called cyclo, cyclohexane. I'm not the master at drawing seven-membered rings, but if you have a seven-membered ring, it's going to look like this. This would be cycloheptane. And if you have an octagon, that would be cyclooctane, so on and so forth. So there you go. We're mostly, we're not going to see a whole lot past cyclooctane in this class, however. Okay, well, how do we name substituents? Because we know that we can have a straight chain of hydrocarbons and we can have branches off of that hydrocarbon. Well, we have to come up with names for those. If you look at the one that I'm going to circle here in blue, if you look at this one here, Right, what is that made of? If I draw that out, we have the bond coming off of the chain, then we have CH2, and then we have CH3, like that. Okay, that's what's inside the green box there that I have circled in blue. CH2, CH3. Well, if I had CH3, CH3, that's two carbons, that would be called ethane. And so what you do is you drop the E on the end and you replace that with il. So it would become ethyl. So this is an ethyl group. The same thing applies to all the other hydrocarbons. If you remove one hydrogen from a methane, you get methyl. Then we go to ethyl, propyl, butyl, pentyl, hexyl, heptyl, octyl, nonyl, and decyl. So, for example, if we look at um, this one right here that I'm circling in blue again down on the bottom, could anybody name that substituent that's down there? Is that propyl? Yeah, it's a propyl, exactly. Because it's got one, two, three carbons in it, right? If you have three carbons in a hydrocarbon, if we back up, three carbons in a hydrocarbon is propane. So if we remove a hydrogen and make it a substituent, it becomes a propyl. And then over here, we have a methyl, like that. So you need to be aware of these substituents. Now, if you find it a little overwhelming looking at it on a Wednesday morning, the more you practice it, the, the better you will become at recognizing substituents, so much so that eventually they'll just become second nature and you won't really have to think about them. Now, what about a ring? If we think about having a substituent on a ring, and this is a propyl group, we just saw this, this is a propyl here. Um, a ring can either be a parent chain or it can be a substituent depending on the situation, and it's based on number of carbons. Let's look at this molecule right here. If we look at the, the longest chain of carbons, okay, it would be the one, two, three, four, five, six carbons in this cyclohexane ring. Remember, when we're numbering carbons, we can't 
go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It doesn't work like that. We can't backtrack over a carbon. That would require you to step back over this carbon, and you can't do that. So the longest chain in this case has six carbons. Here, I only have three carbons in the propyl. So since the propyl is smaller than the parent, it becomes propyl cyclohexane, right? This is just a substituent, the propyl. Another situation is where a ring can be a substituent, and that's when the parent chain, okay, the straight chain is longer. So in the parent, we have one, two, three, four carbons. And since the cyclopropyl is on the first carbon, we call it one cyclopropyl butane, okay? Now, one thing I didn't address was the ill for the cyclos. So if you have a ring that's a substituent, okay, let's say you have this, that would be cyclobutane. If it's a substituent on a bigger chain, like let's say you have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons like that. In this case, it would be cyclobutyl. So cyclobutyl, okay? So a substituent, same thing. You drop the E at the end and you replace it with ill. All right, let's keep looking at substituents. I'm not gonna ask a whole lot of questions about complex branches. However, you have to be aware of it. It could come up on a quiz and it could come up on the final exam. And in fact, the only example that I could find in the textbook that brings up complex branches that when I was looking this morning is question 4.13. And I'm not even sure if I assigned that one. So make sure to take a look at it. But if you have something that doesn't have um, a simple common name, um, so like a substituent that's in this green box here, what do you do to name that, to name that substituent, okay? Uh, you start by naming the longest carbon chain within the substituent, which you can see here, it's got four carbons, right? One, two, three, four, they're all numbered. Then you're gonna name that substituent, right? Based off of that chain, since it's four carbons, it's a butyl, right? You have butane and butyl, okay? And then you've got a substituent on here, don't you? Right, you have a methyl. So this would be a two methyl, a two methyl. So you have a methyl on the second carbon there. So this would become, altogether, it would become 2-methyl-butyl. Now, something else I want to point out, and this is another rule that you have to be aware of. I can't remember if I have it on another slide or not. But anyhow, whenever you have numbers and letters separated in a name, you always separate them by a hyphen. Okay, the numbers and letters are always separated by a hyphen. So numbers, maybe we'll write it down. Numbers and letters. Okay, you're going to separate by a hyphen. If you have numbers, come on, numbers and numbers, okay, you're going to separate those by a comma. And if you have letters and letters, you have no separation, okay? You're just going to put them together. That's why the methyl and the butyl, there's no separation there. Okay, well, what are the kind of substituents can we have? You need to memorize some common substituents and we're gonna go over them in the next couple of slides, okay? These are common because they show up so often in organic chemistry, they show up all the time. Well, if we have our parent, our longest carbon chain, and it has three carbons coming off of this, right? We have a CH2, CH2, CH3. We already agreed that that would be called propyl. The number of carbons and hydrogens in here is C4H9, right? Inside that black circle that I put there. If you look inside this circle over here, you'll also see that this is C4H9, but it's a different arrangement, okay? So this alkyl group or this substituent is a constitutional isomer of a propyl and we call it an isopropyl. Now, the, the um, uh, name that's given to it, if it was named as a complex branch is shown below. You see it says one methyl ethyl down here. You will virtually never have to use that. You have to have memorized propyl and isopropyl. So how does an isopropyl differ? You have a CH and you have a CH3 here and a CH3 here, okay? All right, some other substituents you have to memorize. You might be thinking, well, what if I have more carbons? It's gonna get more complex, right? If we have a butyl, CH2, 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 CH3, Three, did I say C4H9? Deepers, nobody stopped me. Anyhow, so the formula for all these, I'm thinking too far ahead, is C3H7, by mistake. There we go, C3H7. When we get to a butyl, it's C4H9. And there are several ways that you can arrange those. 
You can have what's called a sec butyl, an isobutyl, and a terbutyl. You need to have all four of these memorized. Okay. The way that I memorize these is that the carbon, uh, the first carbon in the sec butyl is a secondary. Or it's got two carbons attached to it, so I think of secondary like that. Anyhow, anything that's an iso always ends off with two methyl groups at the end. Like this, so you have an isobutyl. The same thing with an isopropyl, right? You have two methyl groups kind of at the end of the branch. And then the last one is a terbutyl. So that's where we have a carbon, and it's attached to three methyl groups like that. Okay? So you need to have memorized, you know, methyl, ethyl, propyl, isopropyl butyl, secbutyl, isobutyl, and terbutyl. Another thing I want to mention about these common names, and I don't even know if he brings this up in the textbook or not, but you know, it's kind of like addressing an elephant in the room. If you notice that isopropyl, there's no hyphen, there's no space or anything. But in the same thing with isobutyl, there's no hyphen, there's no space. But if you look at secbutyl and terbutyl, they both have the sec in the, in the tert italicized, and then you have the hyphen. That's just a rule that you have to know. You have to know how to name it properly. So sec and tert, they have these hyphens in them, whereas iso doesn't. And if you're wondering, oh, jeepers, Mr. Dion, this is complicated. Well, again, the more practice that you get at it, the, the, the stronger you will become. And trust me, many students have studied this and have mastered it. And so you will be able to do that too. All right. Now, our book goes into um, groups that have or alkyl groups that have five carbons. I'll just draw them down here. Now, this is something that I didn't include in my slides, but if you have an R group as your parent, let's say that's your parent, and then you have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five carbons, this would be called a pentyl group. Now, in the book, he mentions the isopentyl and the neopentyl. So isopentyl and the neopentyl. And they don't come up a ton in this class, but it might be nice for you to have these ones memorized too. So an isopentyl, just like an isobutyl or an isopropyl has the two methyl groups at the end, right? You have your isopentyl, okay? And a neopentyl looks like this, where you have um, a CH2 and then you have, you know, this thing over here. Again, I didn't even include those in my slides. However, they are in the book. They will show up once in a while. Okay, not, not an abundance of pentyl groups do we look at, but they can show up from time to time, so you should be aware of them, all right? One other thing I want to address before we move on is when I keep saying things like CH2, CH, and CH3. Now, you've heard me say this, because I said it on the last slide, that a CH3 group, okay, that's called a methyl, right? We learned that this morning, okay, that's a substituent, okay? Whenever we have a CH2 in a molecule, it's not called a CH2. It's actually got a name. It's called a methylene. Okay, so instead of me saying CH2, CH2, we say methylene. There's another methylene. And if you have a CH, okay, it's actually not called a CH. It's got a better name than that. It's called a methine. So a methyl, a methylene, and a methine. And those will come up, you know, time and time again in this class. All right. Now, if you're having... You know, if you're getting like a panic attack about putting all this together, what are all these things? Methyl, ethyl, propyl, isopropyl, butyl, terbutyl, secbutyl, isobutyl, right? Well, let's slow down for a second here and let's get back to the parent chain and thinking about just the substituents on that parent chain, okay? So rule number one is when you're putting the IUPAC name together. Let's see if we can take what we've learned this morning and actually name a compound. Well, of course, you would first start by identifying the parent chain. Now, you can see that the parent chain has been identified here. You got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's some kind of heptane. And the person did the same thing here. But you see that one way is correct and one way is incorrect. You see that there is a methyl group, right? There's a methyl group here. Now, you would call this a 2-methyl because it's on the second carbon. You would call that a 2-methyl. If you started numbering over here, it would actually be called a 6 a 6-methyl. Only one of these can be correct, okay? There isn't a bunch of different ways to name a compound. Like somebody can call it Greg, another person calls it Larry. No, there's, there's specific names for all organic compounds that are either correct or incorrect. The reason the second one is correct is because of this rule right here. When one substituent is present, you number the parent chain so that the substituent gets the lowest possible number. What's a lower number? Two or six. 
two is a lower number. So that means that this is the correct way to name it. And this would be incorrect. So again, we find that longest carbon chain and we give the substituent, if we only have one, we give it the lowest possible number. You might be thinking right away, what if I have more than one substituent, Mr. Dion? What do I do then? Now, this is a rule that I find, and I've taught this class a long time. This is a rule that sometimes some students will try to make it more complicated than it is. Let me explain the rule to you. If you have more than one substituent, you find the longest carbon chain, same as always, and you number it, watch carefully to give the first substituent the lowest possible number. Whichever substituent you can give the lowest possible number, do that, and that's the end, okay? Everything else is going to be numbered based off of that. Here, and if you're, the problem that I see students run into is that they'll overthink this rule and they'll think that it's something about adding numbers up and getting a lower sum or something crazy like that. It's got nothing to do with that. The rule is simply give the first substituent the lowest possible number to hell with the rest of them. Just number them what they are. If you give the first number, the first substituent the lowest possible number, you, my friend, will get the right answer. Let me show you what I mean. You see the correct way is down here on the left. So they numbered the longest carbon chain. It's got seven carbons. The way that this is done, I have a methyl group at carbon two. So this would be a two methyl. And then I have two methyls on carbon five. So that would actually be called a five, five dimethyl. And I'll get into the prefix di in a second. Okay. But this is, is two a lower number than five? Yes. And two so that means this is correct. If you had gone the other way, your first substituent would be on carbon three. So the rule is simply the first substituent has to be on the lowest possible number of a carbon. Okay. Give me a thumbs up if that rule makes some sense to you. It's a very important rule. It's got nothing to do with tallying this up. That equals 12. And, you know, that equals 12. It's got nothing to do with adding numbers. And I've seen students try to do that. Great. Thanks, Moira. Perfect. All right. Well, let's keep going from there. And don't worry, we're going to get to some examples. But before we can try some examples, there's a bunch of rules that you have to look at because you can run into problems if you only study like two rules and then you try to name compounds. I know I would run into problems doing that. Uh, let's see here. Um, it says if there's a tie, uh, then you number the parent chain so that the second locant gets the lowest possible number. The locant, the word locant, is just a sassy name in organic chemistry that we use for number. Okay, it means nothing more than number. So a one, a two, a three, right? Look, here's the correct way right here. It wouldn't matter if you numbered going this way. Okay, the first substituent is at carbon two. If you even did it the incorrect way, your first substituent is at carbon two. You also have a substituent at carbon three. Okay, and if you had done it this way, your second substituent would be at carbon five. And so if if the if there's a tie with the first two substituents or with the first substituent, then you keep going until you have more and more substituents and you give the next one the lowest possible number. So three beats a five, it's lower than a five. And so that would be the correct way. What other kind of rules can we run into? What if you have uh, something like this? You've got a substituent on carbon one and you've got a substituent on carbon five. Even if you do it this way, you've got a substituent on carbon one and carbon five. Well, we've looked at methyl, ethyl, propyl, isopropyl, butyl, tert-butyl, sec-butyl. Um, but uh, we haven't talked about the halogens. If you have a fluorine, that's called a fluoro when it's a substituent. If you have a chlorine, that's called a chloro. Try to be um, consistent here. If you have a bromine, you can probably guess that's called a bromo. And if you have an iodine, that's called an iodo. Okay, so here we've got a chloro and a bromo. Well, if it, if you end into a mess, if you get into a mess like this, all you do is is assign the lowest number by the alphabet. So B is low, B comes before C in the alphabet, so bromo wins over chloro. Okay, that's that one. Same rules apply for cycloalkanes. Look, if you have either of these cycloalkanes here, what's the longest carbon chain? It's six carbons, right? Going one, two, three, four, five, six, or one, two, three, um, four. Five, six. Both of these, well, both these molecules are identical. There's three methyl groups. If you start numbering this way and you number this carbon as carbon one, that I, one I just circled in blue, then you have one, one, and three. If you do it the incorrect way, going counterclockwise here, you'd have one, three, three. Here's the tiebreaker. 
a one beats a three. One is lower than three, and that's it, my friends, okay? Nothing more than that. I never said it was simple, but that's the way it goes. Okay, so if we look at a summary, um, to complete the, or sorry, to complete the whole name, you put the number and the name of each substituent before the parent chain, you do it in alphabetical order. I want to talk about this alphabetical order for just a second, okay, or in a second, I should say. Um, it says a prefix is used if a multiple substituents are identical. Now, in terms of this, I don't know how we went from number one to number five. That happened, that escalated quickly. Anyhow, so rule number two, um, so you saw the prefixes. So if you have two of a substituent, you call it di. If you have three of the same substituent, it's tri. If you have four of them, it's tetra. And if you have five of the same substituent, it's penta. Past penta, I don't think we'll look at any hexa, you know, substituted anything in this class. But I want to talk about these prefixes. Prefixes like di, tri, tetra, penta, um, tert, we saw that this morning. Uh, what else? Um, sec. We saw that this morning. Those prefixes you ignore, okay? The only prefixes that you don't ignore in organic chemistry are these three right here. Iso, you don't ignore that one, and cyclo and neo. So if you're wondering, what do you mean by ignore? Okay, well, let's say you have a tri, triethyl, okay, for example. And let's say you had um, cyclo, cyclobutyl, okay, as substituents. The triethyl, you ignore the prefix. So you alphabetize according to the letter E. If you have cyclobutyl, you don't ignore the prefix. You alphabetize it according to the letter C. If you're wondering about the sec butyl or the tert butyl, again, you ignore those prefixes. And so you would alphabetize according to the letter B. So if we go over all the rules, here we go. You identify the longest carbon chain. You identify and name the substituents. Methyl, ethyl, propyl, isopropyl butyl, terbutyl, secbutyl, isobutyl, pentyl, neopentyl, um, isopentyl. You give a locant to each substituent. So a locant, again, is just a number. Then you put them in alphabetical order before the parent, and that's it. That's how you name um, an alkane. And we're going to look at a few examples. Now, I looked in my slides this morning, or my notes, and I noticed, okay, here we go. We have a compound here, and we want to try to name this compound. So this slide, I'm just kind of doing it in, in a step-by-step um, -step approach here, okay? The longest carbon chain here is six carbons, right? The six carbons in this ring. So that tells you that this compound is some kind of <clears throat> cyclohexane, right? It's some kind of cyclohexane. So that means that the name always ends with the parent. This compound ends with cyclohexane. The rest, we're going to figure it out. When we go to number this ring, <clears throat> Do we start here with our, this is a tert-butyl group, tert-butyl, this is an ethyl group, and the, these are both methyl groups, so we would call this a dimethyl since they're both on the same carbon. Anyhow, where are we going to start numbering? Let me get the blue pen out here. Which carbon are we going to start? Are we going to start at one, two, three, four? If we were to do that, we would have one, two, three and four and four, right? We'd have one, two, four, and four. Looks good, starts on the number one. Number one's a pretty low number. But well, hold on a second. What if we started, and I'm gonna to try to erase some of this stuff, okay? What if we started here? We said one, two, three, four, five, six. So then we'd have one, two, and five, five. Well, that doesn't work. One, two, four, four beats one, two, five, five, doesn't it? right? Because a four is lower than a five. So we're still good. But there's a better option, isn't there? Right? And hopefully you noticed, based off of my notes, that the best option would be this one here. If we start where the dimethyls are, one, two, three, four. Because then we have one, one, three, and four. A one beats a two. And so this is correct and this is incorrect. So the numbering that I have on the ring right now, one, two, three, four, five, six, that is the correct way to number that cyclohexane ring. Now we have <clears throat> our substituents. We have a terbutyl in the four position. That means we have a four terbutyl. We have an ethyl in the th at the third carbon. So that's a three ethyl. And we have two methyls on the same carbon. 
So instead of saying um, one dimethyl, we give a locant for every single substituent. A locant is a number, so it's one, one dimethyl. Di meaning two. So we have one, one dimethyl. How are we going to alphabetize these? We ignore all prefixes except iso, cyclo, and neo. And iso and cyclo and neo don't even show up in any of these substituents. Cyclo shows up in the parent, but the parent is always last. So that means the terbutyl is going to be alphabetized by the letter B. The ethyl B will be alphabetized by the letter E. And the dimethyl will be alphabetized by the letter M. So when we put all of this spinach together, I'll just erase this and we'll start over. Let's do it. Remember? We separate numbers and letters by a hyphen. We separate numbers and numbers by a comma. And we separate letters and letters by nothing. So we're going to have a four tert butyl because we start with the letter B, four tert butyl, like that. After that, we have our three ethyl. After that, we have our one, one dimethyl. And then we don't separate that from the parent, which is cyclo cyclohexane, like that. Again, our alphabetization was B, E, and M. We ignore the tert prefix, and we ignore the di prefix. Again, the only prefixes we don't ignore in organic chemistry are iso, cyclo, and neo. All right, well, with that in mind, let's take a look at a couple of compounds and see if we can name them. Could anybody tell me in B what the longest carbon chain is? How many carbons are in the longest chain in B? The cyclohexane? Yeah, six carbons. Right, there are six carbons in the longest continuous chain. I have one, two, three, four, five, six in here, right? If you want to highlight it, one, two, three, four, five, six, like that. I have six carbons. That is my longest carbon chain. Six carbons in a straight chain is hexane, since these are in a ring. This must be some kind of cyclo, cyclohexane. Now, based off of the groups that we looked at, the substituents, you see that this substituent has one, two, three, four carbons. Could anybody identify this substituent based off of the substituents that we looked at this morning? Uh, is it butyl? It's a kind of butyl, right? Because it has four carbons. If it's just plain old butyl, you would have the parent, parent, and then you would have one, two, three, four, right? That would be a butyl. But since you have, like I told you, if you have two carbons coming off of the, of the methine like this, this is called a sec butyl group. So this is a sec butyl. Let me just delete that. So this is a sec butyl. So that means that this compound is sec butyl cyclohexane. Now, if you're thinking, whoa, whoa, Mr. Dion, where's your one and your two and your three and all that stuff? For us to put a number one here is redundant. It's inconsequential because since there's only one substituent on the ring, you don't have to tell anybody where it is. Okay, if there's only one substituent, of course, it's going to be on the first carbon. So that's another nuance is that you don't have to put a number here. So this is simply... Um, sec butyl cyclohexane. Sec butyl, I'm trying to make it all one word. Sec butyl cyclohexane. There you go. So you've named an organic compound. Let's try another one. We'll try this one over here. I'm sure that somebody was looking and found the longest carbon chain in this one while we were talking about the first one. Could anybody tell me how many carbons are in the longest chain in F? Yeah, thanks, Byron. There's eight. Absolutely. Right. And how did you find that? By trial and error. Sometimes it just takes, you know, you got to spend a little time looking around. Dr. Diaz, I share an office with him. He loves to give me an organic compound and go, hey, find the longest chain, you know, give me something really complicated. And then he'll laugh at me if I, if I make a mistake or something. So, um, of course, I will never laugh at a student if they make a mistake. I'm talking about gigantic organic compounds, you know, with 100 carbons. And he'll ask me to find a chain and think it's a joke. Anyhow. A little chemistry humor there. Anyhow, the longest carbon chain, like Byron said, it's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbons like that. Anything else is incorrect, right? If you said, well, there's six carbons here, that's a pretty big number. Well, there's a bigger chain, right? And now we have a ring as a substituent. 
So this is actually a cyclohexyl. Anyhow, I'm getting ahead of myself because we still haven't decided how to name or how to number the carbon chain. I'm gonna throw this out to, to my students. If we call this the left and we call this the right, would you start numbering from the rightmost carbon or the leftmost carbon, the way it's drawn? The right. left. So which one would I start? I would start on the right. Okay, now if you're wondering why is that, Mr. Dion? Because we want to give the first substituent the lowest possible number. If you started over here, you'd have one, two, three. Your first substituent would be on carbon three. If you start from the right, however, you have one, two, and your first substituent is on carbon two. So that's the correct way. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this must be some kind of octane. Now we're going to give a locant, a number, and a name to each one of the substituents. We have a two cyclohexyl, so we separate those by a hyphen. We have a four ethyl, okay, and then we have two, two methyl groups. We have one here and here, and so that would be a five, six dimethyl, okay? Now we need to alphabetize those. We ignore all prefixes except iso, cyclo, and neo. So we're gonna alphabetize according to the letter C for two cyclohexyl, the letter E for ethyl, and M for dimethyl because we ignore that D, that's a prefix, all right? So if we put all that spinach together, I'm gonna to start over here. We have two cyclohexyl, um, four ethyl, Five, six, dang it, I'm still gonna run out of room. Dimethyl, I'll just move this out of the way here. There we go, so, and then um, octane, since our parent has eight carbons. Now, you, you gotta remember that you might look at problems like this when you're practicing and say, oh man, that's, that's, that's complicated, you know, that's a big molecule. But if you learn the rules, right, and one thing I've learned teaching chemistry is that science students love rules. They're like, just tell me the rules, I'll figure them out, and then I'll, I'll be able to answer anything if I understand the rules correctly. That's true with nomenclature. If you understand the rules well, you will be able to master nomenclature, okay? I worked with a guy who was a nomenclature expert, and it's pretty cool when somebody knows, you know, all the rules for complex molecules. Anyhow, uh, let's see here. Naming a bicyclic compound. Wow, what the heck is this? What, what is this thing here, okay? We looked at bicyclic compounds quickly in chapter two. I kind of showed you a couple of structures and I said, well, you know, in this molecule here, you have seven carbons, right? You have one, two, three, four, five, six, and then you have a seventh here in the bridge. That's one way of drawing it, or you could draw it like this. They both represent the exact same thing. But what we're interested in is naming the compound. All right, we're going to figure out how to name bicyclic compounds. You're like, what? I'm going to learn how to name that funny looking thing? Yeah, you are, okay? And it's not that complicated if you just, again, learn the rules, master them, and trust me, you'll be able to, to get it. So the parent, how many compounds are in the parent in both of these? The answer is seven. So you take all the carbons in the bicyclic system, you add them up. We have a total of seven, seven carbons, right? There's seven carbons here, okay? So that means that, the parent is going to have bicyclo in front of it, and then you're going to have heptane. So this would be some kind of bicycloheptane. But you don't just do this. You don't put bicycloheptane, okay? That doesn't tell you enough. There's nothing wrong with bicyclo, and there's nothing wrong with heptane, but you don't do it that way. Let me show you. It gets a little funky. What you do is you do this. You go bicyclo, okay? Then you put an open square bracket and then a closed square bracket. Then you put heptane. And inside those square brackets, we're going to put some numbers. Some numbers? Yeah. We're going to put some numbers in there. What are the numbers? Okay. The numbers come from the carbons that are off of the bridge head carbons. And then you're like, what the hell is a bridge head carbon, Mr. Dion? Let me show you. The carbons where the bridge is attached, right? This is a bridge here. Those carbons are called bridge head carbons. Okay, so both of these are, it's called a bridge, bridge head. And this is probably on another slide, but whatever. Okay, those are called bridge head carbons. Okay, they're part of the seven carbons, right? They're carbon, you know, I'd have them numbered two and four over here. Those are bridge head carbons. Okay, same molecule. 
Well, the numbers that go in here are the number of carbons that are in the bridges. So this is a bridge here. Maybe I'll use a different color, I'll use green. This is a bridge here, this is a bridge here, and this is a bridge as well. How many carbons are in each of these bridges? Well, let me use a different color for this one. Maybe I'll use um, blue for this one here. The two bridges that are in green, how many carbons are in them? There are two carbons in this bridge and there are two carbons in the other bridge in green. The bridge that's in blue, how many carbons are in that bridge? Let's throw that out there to my students. It's not a trick question. Mr. Dion does not like the trick question. Is it two? No, there's not two. It's just one because this is a, just a methylene, right? It's just a CH2. So there's only one carbon in there. So the three numbers that go inside the square brackets are the numbers of the carbons in the bridges. You start with the biggest bridge and you go to the smallest bridge. Well, two of the bridges have the same number of carbons. So we put a two, then you put a dot or a period. You put a two for the other bridge and then you put one for the last one. So that's how you name this compound. So this compound, same compound, would be bicyclo 221 heptane. Okay, it's all based off of the bridge head carbons. Now, um, let's see here. What if you have a substituent on your bicyclic compound? If I was to have just this plain old compound, and forgive me, I'm gonna try my best to draw it here. Mr. Dion ain't the best, he ain't the worst, but ain't the best to draw these. Okay, so this is the bicyclic compound. Here are the bridge heads like this. The total number of carbons that we have in here is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this must be some kind of bicyclooctane, right? It's bicyclo octane. And if we look at the bridges, we have one, two, three carbons in this bridge. So we have a three here. We have one, two carbons in this bridge. And then we only have one here. So it's three, two, one, bicyclo three, two, one octane. But what happens when we have a substituent? So you see that here we have a methyl group over here. All you would do to name that compound is you would just put that it's an eight methyl, right? Because you have an eight here. But you might be wondering, why is it eight? Why didn't they give it the number one? Because you start at a bridgehead carbon when you're numbering the parent, and um, you number the longest carbon chains first, or the longest bridges first. So we could start at either this bridgehead or this bridgehead. In this example, it won't make a difference. We're going to go through the longest bridgehead, the, or sorry, the longest bridge. The longest one has one, two, three carbons in it. The second longest bridge, we keep following the chain. We go, has only two carbons in it. And then we go up to the smallest bridge. So since the smallest bridge <clears throat> is where the eighth carbon is, this would be 8-methyl um, bicyclo 321-octane. Okay? Now, if you look at the examples down here, it shows you the incorrect way of doing it. We have a methyl group right here. What would that be? Would it be a 6-methyl or a 7-methyl? The answer is it's a 6. It's not a 1. We start with the longest bridge. Okay, so we're going to start at a bridgehead carbon. We're going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then up to eight. You have to keep numbering consecutively. You have to follow the order of numbers. One, two, three. You can't go one, two, eight, or something like that. It doesn't work that way. If we had start numbered, numbering at this bridgehead, it might be a knee-jerk reaction for you to say, come on, Mr. Dion, why can't you just go one, two, and then give it a two-methyl? No, because the first rule says you have to go through the longest bridge first. So you might be wondering, you know, well, come on, this number one is closer to the methyl than, you know, this number one is to this methyl. Yeah, but if you follow the order, it won't give you the long, lowest number for the methyl. Let me show you. We go one, two, three, four. We've gone through the longest bridge. Five, we wrap around six, and then we end up with a seven instead of a six. Okay, so we have to always go through the longest bridge first. And we started the bridge head, which will give the first substituent the lowest possible number. All right. Well, with that in mind, let's try naming a bicyclic compound. And if you're like, that doesn't look like anything you showed us before, Mr. Dion, before they all had like funky bridges and stuff. Well, we still have two cycles and they're stuck together. Okay. So 
there are no carbons in the third bridge. Let me show you what I mean. If we start at the bridge heads, we have a bridge head here, and we have a bridge head here. Should I start, if I color code them, could anybody tell me, should I start numbering at the one in red or the one in blue following the rules that we looked at in the previous slide? Blue. I'm going to start at the one in blue. Exactly. Because if I was to go, here's the longest bridge, right? I'm going to go this way. I'm going to go one, two, three, four, five, right? Like that. If I go this way, then I've got one, a substituent at carbon number one. If I go the other way, if I start on the blue carbon, then I've got one, sorry, one, two, and then I have two substituents on here. So I'd have two, two, okay, instead of just a two here. And so that's going to be my tiebreaker. So we start on the carbon in blue. What's the first rule? We go through the longest bridge. So we have one, two, three, four, five. What's the next longest bridge? We got six, seven, eight, and there is no other bridge, right? There's nothing doing this or anything like that. So the last bridge has actually no carbons, right? And if you're like, I'm not sure, Mr. Dion, I know that this is some kind of bicyclo, I know this is some kind of bicyclo octane because I've got a total of eight carbons. That's true. Okay, but let's look at the bridges. Here we have our bridgehead carbons. In this bridge, we have one, two, three, four carbons. In this bridge, we have two carbons. So we've got a four, then a two, but there's no other bridge. There's nothing like this or anything like that. So the last bridge is actually a zero. So this is a bicyclo um, four, two, zero. Now we've got four substituents. They're all methyl groups. So we've got a methyl group here, 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 and here. So we have two, two, five, seven tetramethyl. So this is a um, two, two, five, seven tetra methyl bicyclo four two zero octane all right if we have time we'll come back to the bicyclic structures later but there's a lot of content to cover in this chapter so we're going to have to move on from there and we're going to move on to section 4.3 which deals with constitutional isomers um, isomers are simply um, compounds that have the same molecular formula but have different structures. I think this, the classic example that I always bring up in class is C2H6O. Okay, It can either be this, which is, I'm drawing ethanol, or it could be this, which is dimethyl ether. And those are two very different compounds. Well, the same thing can exist for an alkane. If you look at these two compounds here, these are both, both are C6H14. Right, they both have the same molecular formula. This compound is hexane. Right, you memorized that this morning. This one, if we go one, two, three, four, five, this would be two methyl, two methyl pentane. Right, so they are different compounds, different IUPAC names, different physical properties. Okay, very different compounds. Okay, different connectivity of atoms. So it's important that you understand the difference between isomers and constitutional isomers. Um, so I'm going to back up a second just to address one question. A student asked me, can we only have two bridges? And the answer is no. Okay. When you're naming a bicyclic compound, you're always going to have three bridges. So if it's something like this, then the third bridge is just a zero. All right. So constitutional isomers. Well, this is a question that comes up on, so I teach nursing organic chemistry sometimes, so organic chemistry for, you know, nursing students. And, um, you know, sometimes they'll come up with questions like this on their standardized exams where they'll say, let's say you have C4H10. How many possible isomers are there? And you're like, well, let's see, there's butane and then there's um, two methylpropane. So those are possibilities. What if you have, you know, C5H12? Well, let's see, you've got pentane, you've got uh, two methyl butane, and then you've also got this uh, right here. So this would be 2,2-dimethylpropane. So those are the possibilities. But you see that it gets out of hand really quickly. Once you get into more and more carbons, you get into, you know, you get up to 15 carbons, there's 4,000 4, possibilities. And 40 carbons, I mean, then it's just, you know, maybe I'll put that as a bonus question, right? Draw all the isomers of C40H82. Anyhow, it gets out of hand really quickly. And there's no simple formula for us to predict how many 
um, how many um, constitutional isomers there are for a specific formula. I have a question for you. It might seem like a silly question, but I want to see if you understand what's going on here. What if I had 100 carbons in a molecule? Could anybody tell me how many hydrogens you would have in that molecule? If it's a saturated alkane, like all of these, like if you were to keep going down to C100, how many hydrogens would you have? 202. 202, exactly. Because the general formula here for all of these is CNH2N plus 2 for all of these um, alkanes. All right, so if I have C100, I multiply 100 by 2, that's 200, I add 2, 202. All right, so you've got to be able to recognize different structures as either being isomers or the same compound. Now here we have C6, right, we have C6H14. All of these compounds are C6H14, but we have a few different isomers. The ones that aren't highlighted, this one, this one, this one, and this one, those are all constitutional isomers of each other, and this is a constitutional isomer of it as well. But you need to be able to recognize the fact that these two compounds are identical. These are not constitutional isomers. How do you know that they are constitutional isomers? Well, you can do a couple of things. The first way is the easiest one, and that's probably the one you're going to master um, eventually, which is manipulating the molecule in three dimensions in your mind. Right? All they're doing is taking the molecule in the first green box and they're rotating it this way a little bit. Okay? And then uh, they're rotating one of these bonds right here because there's free rotation around a sigma bond. Right? Any single bond has free rotation around it. The other option, and this is the only, I only use this rule when I've got no other option in my availability. And, you know, if you're really, really stuck, if you're caught between a rock and a hard place, you can just name them. Okay, and you see that here you'd have one, two, three, four, five. So this would be three methyl pentane. And here you have one, two, three, four, five. And so this would be the exact same name. This is also three methyl pentane. Okay, if they have the same name, they're the same compound. Now, again, I don't like to use that rule a whole lot unless I really, really need to. Anyhow, I want to talk very quickly about section 4.4, and we're going to skip section 4.5 for the most part. But uh, I want to talk about the relative stability of all these different isomers. Okay, so say, for example, we look at these three compounds here. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So this is octane. So all of the compounds on here are some isomer of C8H18, right? Using the formula CNH2N plus 2. 2 times 8 is 16, plus 2 is 18. If you look at these three compounds, and I would like you to make sure that you read this section of the book. It doesn't take very long. But if you burn, if, if, you know, if you cause all three of these hydrocarbons on here to undergo combustion, they all have the same molecular formula, what you find is that the, the heat of combustion or the enthalpy of the reaction is different for all three of them. And you're thinking, come on, you're getting the same products. You're getting eight carbon dioxides and nine water. You know, you're adding 12 and a half oxygens. It's the same... It's the same balanced equation all three times, but you're getting different enthalpies. Well, the reason why is because the more branching you have, so here's the more branched one. You can see there's, you know, you got two methyl groups here and two methyl groups here. The more branching you have on a compound, the more stable it becomes. So you see that this one gives off the least heat, so it means it's already the most stable to begin with. Now, the reason why is based off of something called proto-branching, which is way beyond the scope of our class. Don't worry about that word. I'm never going to ask you. If you have an inquiring mind, you're like, I can't fall asleep unless I know all about it, go ahead and research it, but it's, it's way beyond the scope of our class. All you need to know is this down here. This is what you need to know for your quiz and from the, for the rest of the class, is that branched alkanes are going to be lower in energy and more stable than straight chain alkanes. And this concept is going to come back in chapter six. Now, the whole thing that I'm starring here, that might be worth the value of maybe one question on your next quiz. Okay, it's definitely not going to be a whole section on it. Uh, this summer, this past summer, I was teaching this class. And uh, I had a student in the class who asked a, an interesting question. It's a question that I just assumed. You know, you should never assume things, right? No, that's, that's not good. You know, assume that your students understand everything. And the student said, you know, like, 
what's the purpose of this reaction? You know, where are these alkanes coming from? And, you know, you think about molecules like methane, ethane. Methane is the major component of natural gas. You think about propane. Everybody knows what that's used for if you've ever used a propane barbecue. Butane is found in a butane lighter right? Or maybe a butane powered curling iron or something if you go camping. Anyhow, um, then you get into pentane, hexane, heptane, octane. Everybody's heard the word octane, right? You've heard about a high octane performance or some silly thing like that in a, maybe a music review. But octane, you see that when you go to the gas pump, it'll say, what's the octane rating of this gasoline? So you've heard that word before. And the student asked, they said, where do these alkanes come from, man? Like, wh where do you buy these alkanes? And I said, they all come from petroleum, right? They all come from crude oil. You know, if you turn on the news and it gets to the finance section, there's always something or usually something in there about crude oil, right? How, how much does a barrel of oil cost and how many are they processing from this well, you know, in Saudi Arabia or wherever. And so um, that's where all of these hydrocarbons come from. They all come from the petroleum history, uh, industry and they're all separated by distillation. Now, you, I'm never going to, I'm probably not going to ask you anything about this slide, but just so you know, you know, you should have an idea what the hell we're talking about and where, you know, things come from. So when they process a barrel of crude oil, only about 20% of that is, um, is gasoline, is the actual fraction that's found in gasoline. So we have other ways of, you know, um, producing or a greater amount of gasoline out of a barrel of crude oil. And that's through cracking and refining. It goes over it in the textbook. I'm not going to ask you about cracking and I'm not going to ask you about refining. But in case you're interested, you know, um, you'd be able to learn more about the petroleum industry and where gasoline comes from. If you've ever seen the molecule or the molecule, jeepers, Mr. Dion's got molecules on the brain. If you've ever seen the movie, There Will Be Blood with Daniel Day-Lewis, right? They're, they're, they start, you know, um, uh, drilling for oil. And the main reason that people drilled for oil back in the 1800s was to get kerosene because kerosene burned very cleanly, right? And, you know, if you think about human history, people lived in the dark for a long time. You know, the dark ages is a real thing. Um, there's even paintings, you know, of families sitting around a table with one candle and everybody trying to do things by one candle. And candles were expensive, you know, get, obtaining the wax. And then people used whale oil, but there's obvious problems there. First of all, you're destroying the whales. And second of all, whale oil burned very, um, very sooty, it had a very sooty flame. So um, have you ever heard the expression, you know, go outside and get some fresh air? That's where that originated was from burning whale oil. Anyhow, I think it also originated from some of the first paints. But anyhow, it's kind of a history lesson. Has anybody here read the book um, At Home by Bill Bryson? At Home. This has nothing to do with chemistry. Direct. Has anybody read this book? Or a brief history of everything? No? Okay. Anyhow, if you want a really entertaining read, you know, if you're like, I don't have enough work to do already, I would highly recommend this book. It's one of the coolest books I've ever read. It's all about the home. And anyhow, he talks about whale oil and stuff. Anyhow. Um, yeah, so, you know, think about asphalt. It's on a, on a road. When they, you know, tar a road in the summer, where does that come from? It comes from the petroleum industry as as well but asphalt has a really high boiling point right asphalt doesn't disappear into the air anyhow we'll stop talking about that this is just a picture i threw in here i took this off of google images or something but this shows you how the distillation is done you start with the crude oil and then you have all the different fractions in there anyhow i won't spend too much time on that and let's get into what are called newman projections right you can really shake your fist and say newman just like jerry right anyhow newman projections were developed by Melvin Newman at Ohio State University I, a long time ago, you know, back in the 1900s. Anyhow, it says here, the rotation around carbon-carbon single bonds allows a compound to adopt a variety of possible 3D shapes called conformers. That's to represent the three-dimensional shape of a compound. And we have the wedge and the dash here. We have what's called a sawhorse. And we also have what's called a Newman projection. And we're gonna focus largely today or the rest of the lecture on Newman projections. Let me show you what the hell a Newman projection is first, pardon my language, by going back to my camera here. Oop. All right, can you guys see? I have a model here. There's a light in the background. Come on. Here, there we go, something like, there we go. That looks a little bit better. So this is a model, it's called a we fever model. I can't see anything. 
Sorry, Sorry, you're still on your screen. Can you see my screen now, or you see my model? No, I, I see, your, see screen. your screen, but not your camera. Mm, that is weird. How about now? Can you see it now? No, sir. No. Mm -mm -mm. You have to switch to your main camera, the one you use to focus on your face. I have. It just isn't working for some reason. There you are. There. Is it working now? Yep. Yes, sir. All right. This isn't my first rodeo. I've used the camera many times. Anyhow, so this is an ethane molecule. So this is CH3, CH3. Anyhow, so you can see here's my ethane molecule. And if you're wondering, you know, hey, Mr. Dion, some of your hydrogens are black and some of them are silver. I know. Okay. Anyhow, this is called, a, these are called Fieser models. They're pretty expensive, but there's a lot of cool things that you can do with Fieser models that you can't do with the regular ball and stick models that you get in a, you know, a general chemistry lab. Anyhow, the first thing is that we have free rotation around a single bond, right? This is a single bond. This is the carbon-carbon bond. And we have free rotation around that bond. So when you rotate, you know, the bond, these are all different conformations. This is a conformation. This is a conformation. This is a conformation. This is a conformation, right? So there's literally infinite, an infinite number of different conformations that the molecule can exist in. If you look down the carbon-carbon axis, and you spread all the hydrogens as far away from each other as possible, that is called a staggered conformation, okay? Everything's as far away from each other as possible. The angle, let me hold it up here, the angle here between two hydrogens, whether it's these two or these two or these two down here, the angle between those would be 360 degrees divided by six. So that angle is 60 degrees, okay? We call that a dihedral angle. Again, this is called a staggered conformation. If I rotate that by 60 degrees, I get this where everything is blocking everything else out. We call that an eclipsed conformation, and the dihedral angle then between the hydrogens is zero, right? If I just, just turn it a little bit, you can see there's a little bit of an angle, but again, when it's fully eclipsed, I have zero degrees. So eclipsed, there's a zero degree dihedral angle, and when I turn it like this, 60 degrees, I get a staggered conformation, and the dihedral angle, or the angle between these two hydrogens, is 60 degrees. And everything is, all the repulsions are minimized in the staggered conformation. Now, as far as the, um, the wedge and dash goes, the wedge and dash would be looking at the molecule like this, kind of, okay? So you can see that this hydrogen is going out and back. This one is coming towards you. This one is in back. This one is coming out towards, sorry, this one's in the plane. This one's going in the back, and this one is coming up towards you. So that would be a representation of a wedge and dash. And a sawhorse is when you would turn it on an angle. That'd be kind of hard to show it like this. But anyhow, that's what a sawhorse would be. You kind of turn it on an angle. And you might be wondering, why do you have so many different ways of representing the same molecule? And the answer is, it depends on the situation. You know, when you would um, apply uh, which uh, way of, or which, um, technique of viewing the molecule, if you will. All right, so let's go back to my slides. So let's see here. Can you guys see my slides again? It's section 4.6? Yep. All right, good. So yes. again, the Newman projections are really good for assessing relative stability of conformations resulting from the rotation around a single bond. So what I was doing is just spinning this bond here, right? And I was showing it to you like that. And again, this angle here, is 60 degrees in the staggered conformation, and we call that a dihedral angle. So um, a Newman projection is the perspective of looking straight down a particular carbon-carbon bond. All right, so um, if we're looking down this carbon-carbon bond, if you see the viewer is looking down, you can see their eyelash on the top. So the carbon-carbon bond is this one here, going from this carbon to this carbon. What does the viewer see? The viewer sees this when they look down the bond. Why would that be? Okay, well, this carbon here that I am put the blue on here, that is this one right here in the center. What's coming off of that carbon? I have a methyl group right here. This is a methyl group. But all of these, the methyl group, this carbon, this carbon here, and the chlorine, everything I have in green here, kind of pointed out by the green line, those are all in the plane, right? In the plane of the viewer. And so everything that's in the plane is gonna be vertical like this. What else is on that carbon that I have the blue dot on? 
Well, not only is there the methyl group and the rest of the molecule, but there's a hydrogen going in the back, right? And there's a hydrogen coming out in front like this. We don't draw those because this is a bond line structure, but they're there. If I label these HA and HB, if the viewer is looking down this axis, right? Could anybody tell me if I circle this one over here in black, would that be HA or HB? Anybody manipulating that, that in their mind? HB. No, it's not HB, it would be HA. The reason why is because the viewer is looking down here. Anything that's going in the back, the back would be on the left hand side, okay? Anything that's coming out in front, anything that's coming out in front would be on the right hand side, okay? So you see, since HA is in the back in this specific case, it's going to be on the left-hand side, so that's HA and that's B, HB. If we look at the methyl group, okay, the methyl group is going back, right? This methyl group is going back into the page. So if the viewer, again, is looking down this way, okay, the methyl group is going to be in the back like that. And so the viewer is, again, kind of looking down like this. So it's going to be on this side, the left-hand side. So there's my methyl. And then there's also a hydrogen here that's not drawn in, okay? We'll call that HC, and that would be this one here. Now, sometimes it's helpful to, you know, do all manner of things. I'll see students, like, literally picking up pieces of paper and turning them on edge and things like that. If that's what you've got to do to rationalize it in your mind, um, do it. You know, you do whatever you can to be able to draw a Newman projection properly. Now, something that I learned from my boss um, Dr. Anderson, who's taught this class for probably 35 years or something, is something that he told me is that um, if anybody in the class has experienced building models or maybe working on a car engine where you're used to looking at pictures in two dimensions and then working with something that's in three dimensions and then going back and forth like that, he said often those students will master the idea of um, um, you know, being able to manipulate things in their mind and they can do it a little bit quicker. So what I want to do here is I want to draw what the observer sees when she or he looks down this carbon axis right here, this carbon-carbon bond. I'll highlight it in yellow. I'm not a mega fan of the way this is drawn for your first practice problem. I'm going to help you out with this one a little bit. We'll say that one of these chlorines is on a wedge and we'll say that this chlorine is on a dash, okay? So this, you know, one of them is coming out in the front and one of them is going in back. And if you're wondering, Mr. Dion, how would I know that? The reason you'd know that is because generally speaking, anything that's in the zigzag like that, that's going to be in the plane. Okay, that's in the plane of the observer. What else is in this molecule or on this molecule that's not drawn? Now, we could kind of spruce it up here. We've got a methyl group here. We've got a methyl group here. But on this carbon, we have two hydrogens, right? That's CH2. We know that that carbon is tetrahedral. You have a bond here and a bond here that are in the plane. So that means that there is a hydrogen going in back and there is a hydrogen coming out in front. So something that I neglected to say on the last slide is that the second carbon, okay, the second carbon of the carbon-carbon bond you're looking down, that's the one that's represented by the circle. Okay, that's the second carbon. So let's start by drawing what we can see. We'll start with the first carbon, maybe I'll color code them again, so we'll make a little dot like that. Then we have the carbon in the back, this one here. Okay, now, what is in the plane? Okay, in the plane, up and down, in our vertical plane. Well, everything that's in the plane is everything that's not a dash or a wedge. So we have a methyl group going up, right? This methyl group is pointing up from the person's eye. That tells me that there's a methyl group sticking up like this. What else is attached to that carbon? I have a hydrogen going down into the left, and I have a hydrogen going down into the right. If I label them HA and HB, if I circle this one in red, could anybody tell me, is that HA or is it HB? HB. Yeah, it's HB because it's going in the back, right? That's pointing in the back. 
you got to twist the molecule in this direction, right? You're going to twist it this way and twist it back that way when you're viewing it in the Newman projection. So this, in fact, would be HB. This one would be HA. We have this methyl group in the plane. So that's going to be pointing down like this. Then we have the two chlorines. Now, since they're the same substituent, we don't really have to worry about it a whole lot. We've got one chlorine up here and one chlorine up here like this. But if I label them A and B, then it gets a little trickier. If I call this one A and I call this one B, if I circle this one in blue, could anybody tell me, would that be the chlorine labeled A or B? A. Exactly, because it's going behind the page, right? It's going in back. So this would be chlorine A and this would be chlorine B. All right, now if you're a little confused on all this, or we're kind of running out of time, you're going to have to do some practice on this. There is nobody who gets out of, you know, studying Newman projections without doing lots and lots of practice. I've already covered the concept of the dihedral angle with you when I switched over to my camera. Okay, I said that the dihedral angle is 60 degrees when everything is fully staggered like this. Another name for dihedral angle is torsional angle. And I also went over what is a staggered conformation and an eclipsed conformation. Now, when they draw an eclipsed conformation in a textbook, they can't cover the hydrogens up perfectly. But, um, yeah, that's how we would draw um, an eclipsed, eclipsed ugh, conformation. Anyhow, all right. And you can probably guess that this is going to be higher in energy, right, because these hydrogens are so close to each other, right? They're almost, you know, they're going to be blocking each other. And so that's going to cause a strain. In fact, the difference in energy between these two conformations is 12 kilojoules per mole. So what I would like you to do before class on Friday, because you can see that it's kind of like, you know, organic chemistry is a bit like the frog in boiling water, right? It gets a little more complicated as things move along. So what I would like you to do, and also today's lecture is very different from some of the other things that we looked at, right? Today... You know, we're looking at drawings and manipulating drawings, whereas last class we talked about PKAs and acidity and looked at molecules and all that kind of stuff. So what I highly recommend that you do from now on, and I've told you this before, but I just, I've taught the class enough to know that, um, it, you know, reminding your students is never, not always a bad thing. So first of all, I would always read the textbook before coming to class. At a minimum, I would always try the problems that are in the slides before coming to class. And if you have time left over, um, try some of the problems from the text because you have a whole solutions manual to guide you through that. Okay. I will freely admit, you know, I was an organic chemistry student for a long time. I studied it in graduate school. And I can honestly tell you that in a subject that I've dedicated my life to and I really thoroughly enjoy, for me, somebody who is very passionate about it, and I don't expect all my students to be passionate about organic chemistry. I'd be insane to think that. Um, but in order for me to, to do well in school and to understand what was going on in lecture, I always had to read ahead of time, right? You've got to have a little bit of knowledge about what I'm going to say before coming in because there's just so much content and so many concepts that just hearing me teach it one time, you know, the first time, I would think it's kind of difficult to learn it that way. But again, um, you, you know, you can take my advice and you don't have to take my advice if you don't want to, but something, um, that I'll just kind of whet your appetite with for Friday to get you excited about Friday's lecture. This is a cyclohexane molecule. C6H12 is not a benzene. Benzene has uh, three double bonds in it. Anyhow, but this is a cyclohexane, and this is where we're going to get next class. So when you read the chapter, you're going to learn about the chair. Right? This kind of looks like a chair to you, doesn't it? Doesn't it look just like an Adirondack chair? Right? You can put your back here, put your tuchus there, put your legs down here. Anyhow, next class, we're going to talk all about cyclohexane. Oops, I dropped it. And how, I know class is over, just give me one second. How cyclohexane can flip. It can do a ring flip. And I don't mean like a pancake, like flip like that. I mean it can rotate its bonds. Watch this. You see this methyl group is pointing up. Watch this. Pa Poom. And then you flip it. And now the methyl group is pointing out like this. So it's kind of cool. Anyhow, something to kind of get you excited about Friday's lecture. And uh, yeah, there you have it.